I, I may have to back up just a little bit, which is not a big deal. Yeah, that's part of uh, the fantail. Yeah, this is probably the keel right here. Yep. I'm not sure what part. I mean, somebody like Ken Marshall would probably nail it in two seconds. But, uh, I mean, this looks like the turn turn of the, the bilge keel here. Right. That's a piece of it anyway. But I just put those two pieces together. I think that's, that's well, I guess I'm still not done with this whole area. I still haven't gotten out that I think that my great-grandmother in her account was implying that Captain Smith, you know, was trying to save himself. And I absolutely do not believe that. No, I think I, she was angry. I don't believe that. He was taking people in that lifeboat, coming back yeah. and taking them back in. You know, bringing mm -hmm. people repeatedly that, into my, the lifeboat. That's that's my opinion too. Um, we weren't there; we can't guarantee anything. But that's what it sounds like. <clears throat> I think honestly, often about what he must have thought when Andrews told him um, the ship had an hour to live. Uh, uh, but all of those men on that bridge and Ismay at that time, I just can't imagine the sorrow and the ang the anxiety. I mean, how it would have crushed your brain. How did they even manage to function as well as they did? He got on with it. He he uh, really loaded those lifeboats, and you know there was no drama with him. I mean, he just seemed to be the best version of himself in the last two hours and 40 minutes of his life. He as did, far as he, I'm concerned. He, he did what he, he knew once Andrews told him the ship was sinking, he knew he couldn't save everybody. All he could do is save the people he could. Right. <clears throat> he was spotted at quite a number of lifeboats, um, um, all on the port side. Um, actually he was helping load a few of them. Right. Yep. Um, and there's probably a lot of pan there was panic on the deck, especially at the aft port boats. Um, all you can do is what you can do. But he, he stayed calm. Not, yeah, but he didn't get off. Oh. He, you know, they, they like to vilify Bruce Ismay. Right. Because he was the head of the shipping line. What did he do that night? He helped people on the starboard side into lifeboats. Mm -hmm. He only got into the last lifeboat that was successfully lowered. Um, at two o'clock that night, if he had not gotten into that lifeboat, it just would have meant another death. Right. He, he had put, he put dozens, if not a hundred or two people in those lifeboats, helped them get in. And, um, he did what he could and he got off only when there wasn't much time left. Yeah. Um, he, he was not as calm as some of the other officers. No, no. And, but mean, he wasn't an there, officer. No, no, right. And he, he seemed to kind of be losing it and screaming and trying to take control. And the officers were saying, you know, you need to stop this. Uh, you know, you're not in control here. So, which he did, standing out there, you know, in his pajamas and robe. <laughs> he must have been pretty cold. I... I and then, you know, when he got on the Carpathia, um, I don't know, I've heard a report that he went into the, initially, and was kind of rude to people and demanding. I, what and then I he recall stayed in his is cabin. he got on there, he was just kind of standing up against the bulkhead. And somebody came up and asked him, can we help you? And he said, I, I wish you'd just put me, put me in a nice quiet place where I can be alone. I think they took him to the doctor's cabin? I don't know. I'd have to look. He went up. to a cabin, and once he got in there, he did not come out. Yeah. For the whole trip. Yeah. Um, I'm sure he was in heavy shock. Oh, absolutely. He knew damn well um, that hundreds of people had died. Oh, yeah. Um, there's conflicting stories when Ismay was on uh, the boat deck at the last. Were there people around collapsible sea? Were there not people around collapsible sea? He says there was nobody else around, right. so I got in the lifeboat. Um, but there's also reports of shooting at collapsible sea.
Mm -hmm. um, what's the truth? I, I, we don't know. Um, but we do know that he got off in one of the last boats. He put people, other people in boats ahead of him. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't gotten in, it wouldn't have made it wouldn't have made any difference. That boat was fairly full. Yeah. If he hadn't gotten in, it would he would it would have meant just one more death. Right. So, I mean, if I had been in his situation, would I have jumped in the lifeboat? Probably. If there's nobody around that I can help get in, mm -hmm. I probably would have jumped in. Well, you know, it's interesting when I taught that class at the university. One of the questions that I always asked. You know, I'd go around the room and it was always 18 students because that was the size. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'd ask the men and the women, you know, what would you do? And I, I think because it was such a shocking question, they were very honest about it. And it was, you know, some people said absolutely, you know, and I applaud these young men who were honest about it. They said, if I had a chance, I'd get in a lifeboat absolutely and save myself because I know that I have a very strong survival instinct. Mm -hmm. And then a couple young men, you know, got this very kind of dissociative look on their face and said, absolutely, I would have, you know, just stepped back and I would have not made any attempt to get into a lifeboat. I would have helped women get in and I would not have gotten in. And I believed them. Mm -hmm. The way they said it, I believed all of them. And then the, the other question that I asked was, I told the story of Rhoda Abbott. Right. And I said, she uh, initially tried, she had two sons and, you know, they were teenagers. One was younger than the other and looked more like a child. And they were going to let her in with her younger child, but not her older child. And she this wasn't acceptable to her. So she decided to get out of the lifeboat with her younger child and stay on the deck with both her sons. Right. And eventually when the ship went under, they went into the water and she lost track of both of her sons and they both died, but she lived. And she was the only woman pulled out of the water. Yeah, which, has the, which had the sides down. She stood in the collapsible A for several hours while other people were dying around her and falling into the sea. Right. Um, it's just, just such an incredible story that she could have at least gotten in a lifeboat with one son and yeah. the other son would have died. But she decided that she wanted to stay with both her sons and get back on deck. And then they both died and she lived. And it just rips my heart out. It's just such a... A horrible, horrible, horrible story. So sad. And I asked each person, what would you have done if you were Rhoda Abbott? Would you have tried to save one son and, and stayed in that lifeboat with him? Or would you have gotten back on deck to be with both your sons? And it was just so fascinating. I, you know, they, they took it so seriously. You could tell they were pained trying to think what they would do mm -hmm. if they were faced with that situation. And I still, sometimes I think about her and I literally just get a pit in my stomach how horrible that was. But yeah, for certain people it was far worse. Far worse. Okay, so somewhere along the way. I'm having to go back and find a few pieces that I didn't quite get in. Not a whole lot of pieces left yeah, in these bowls. Yeah, I know, I know. So this goes, goes there. What's going here? What would you have done if you were Rhoda Abbott? I don't know that I would have done anything different. I don't know if I could have done anything different. Um, would you have gotten out of the lifeboat with your younger son? Probably. I think. Hard to say, but I, 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 sus I think I, I would have tried to get my family into a lifeboat. 
and then um, unless now if, if a, the officer said I could get in I probably would but I'd get my family in and then I'd, if I had to I'd step back just like many men did that night yep um, I probably would have been trying to help people into the lifeboats as time went on over the night but If you look up a classic dilemma, which is a choice between two things that are equally bad. Yeah. They have a picture of Rhoda Abbott in that. You know? Mm -hmm. Is that is just an impossible Sophie's choice. Now, let's see. Uh, we've talked about Smith and Andrews. We've talked about Rhoda Abbott. And Ismay. And Ismay. We've talked about... Um, Archie Butt. We've talked about Archie Butt. Um... Um, no, we haven't talked too much about Fifth Officer Lowe. Um, he, Fifth Officer Lowe slept through the accident. And later when, um, Boxhall came around to wake the officers up, Lightoller was up, Pittman was up, and I don't, we don't know whether he actually went into Lowe's quarters to try to get him up or he, or he went in and said something and Lowe just didn't wake up. Um, Lowe later on said, when we sleep, we die because they don't get a lot of sleep. So anyway, Lowe did not wake up when Boxhall came around. At some later point in time, he heard foot, feet on the deck outside his, right. his quarters and he looked around and he went out and looked around and he found out the ship's in deep trouble. So he comes out on deck around the time they were getting ready to lower five and seven. He started helping lowering those boats. While he was working on number five, Ismay was there trying to help, but getting kind of wound up. And he's saying, lower away, lower away, lower away. And Lo got ticked off at him and said, if you get out of the way, I'll do my job. Yeah. And... Um, Ismay kind of sheepishly walked down probably to like did, number didn't three. Didn't he cuss at him? Who? Or, um, low? Yeah, what well, that just about what he what I said. Yes, but with some bad words. I don't remember the bad words. <laughs> I don't have my research material here, but um, but low helped at five. He helped at three. He went up. He says he helped at one. And then because the crowds were starting to appear back at the port aft boats, he went back there on the, op in essence, across the ship and back. And he found uh, Moody trying to load the boats there and they kind of split it up. Um, Lowe started working at number 14, which was the, not the last boat there, but the second one and starting people in and, um, he started loading the people into the lifeboat and at a certain point they started lowering, but people were trying to jump into the lifeboat. So Lowe pulled out his revolver and yep. fired, I think three shots down along the side of the ship. Yep. And uh, just kind of scare people off. There was one woman who was trying to get into 10. She started falling between the lifeboat and the, and the ship because 10 was hanging out about a, couple of feet exactly um from the ship and she missed it and she started dropping through and somebody down on a deck grabbed her and brought her back up pulled her on the ship supposedly she climbed back up to the a deck and got into number 10 we have mm -hmm. no idea who that woman is but she's depicted in both a night to remember and cameron's film. yes 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 yep. this is a well-known story yep so when low got to the water he kind of started pulling away from the ship he gathered together <clears throat> lipo 10, lipo 4, uh, collapsible D, and number 12 into a group. And he decided he was going to go back in to pick up people in the water. Right. Um, he couldn't go back in right away, but he, he said, there's, there's too, many, too much activity. I, I would get swamped. So he shifted people around between those five lifeboats, mm -hmm. and he pretty much emptied out his lifeboat, which was number 14. Um, <clears throat> Evans and Bully, who had been in 10, 
they moved over to 14 to go back into the debris field and pick up people. Um, when Lowe and these other people went back into the debris field, him um, and three other people, one of whom was a first-class passenger lady named Hoyt, who was a quite a large man. And they and had he trouble. eventually died, right? He died in, in the way. lifeboat. Right. They di he died in the lifeboat. Um, and then after that, Low, um, <clears throat> as dawn was starting to break, he saw collapsible, I think it was, well, he saw that collapsible, collapsible D wasn't working very well, so he took it in tow. Mm -hmm. Then he pulled um, people off of A, collapsible A, which was in the water, the, it was the boat with Rosa Abbott right. in it, Rhoda Abbott. Mm -hmm. And he pulled those people off and put them in his boat. Um, and then he towed Collapsible D over to the Carpathia and got And he put a sail up. He actually, up. yes. Because the people don't realize He was the only one that, that did that. That's right, because they, they actually were appointed with sails yeah. in, in each lifeboat. Right, but he was the only one yep. that got a, a sail up. And he got the sail out and then... And, and they, there's actually a, a, one of the Ogden photos from the Carpathia shows low uh, sailing. And the lifeboat over yes. to the side and, of the Carpathia. And towing collapsible D right. at the same time. Exactly. It's funny, I have a neighbor who's uh, from Great Britain. And he's from, from Pill, the village, the same village that Lowe is from. Okay. Yeah. There's a really good book on um, on um, Fifth Officer Lowe. Um, it's called Titanic Valor. Uh, it's I've read that. It's, it's written awesome. by Inger Scheel. Um, I may have the pronunciation a little wrong, but... She's Australian, right? She's Australian, and it's a really good book. Uh -huh. Um. um and Inger did make a statement, I did see her make a statement not too long ago that she's hoping to um, write some more Titanic officers oh. material. You know, when I was at um, the Care of the Library researching Walter Lord's papers, I actually found the original um, negative of the picture of the four officers together. The and, original negative? Yes. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing what are in because uh, a lot of people gave Walter Lord things. Yes. Because at that point they didn't really care about these things anymore, and um, you know there was it's really quite impressive, young man. I mean, even though he was asleep and he slept through the the accident, um, but once he woke up, you know he was kind of saucy. He you know yeah back talked the you he know was, Ismay he, he, and he and back talked he, Ismay and threatened some people of the women with his revolvers in his, in his lifeboat. Yeah, threatened people with a revolver. Some of the women in the lifeboat thought he was uh, inebriated. <laughs> Which is not true because he was not. a teetotaler. Right, right. Um, but he also was an incredibly handsome man. And a lot of the women swooned after him as well. <laughs> in fact, you know, this, this kind of plagued him, you know, his whole life. You know, people would always refer to him as such a handsome, as the handsome officer. Mm -hmm. So, and he got kind of a following for that. I'm creating my own little Easter egg <laughs> tile. So this is Bill Wormstadt signing a piece from the stern section that will never be seen again. But if history checks this YouTube, you'll you know go. this is authentic. He formed a... Um, I think, was it Renee Harris that he formed a kind of relationship with and they corresponded for many years? And oh, I don't, I don't distinctly recall. But I'm he not was a saying very nice. Wrong, I just don't recall. He was a very nice guy. I've read a lot about him in that Titanic Valor and, and other books about him. And he, he seemed like a really serious, nice guy. And um, I think he, right after the accident, he got a bad rap because of some of what he did. But he was, he was, yeah, yeah. He was a good I guy. Mean, he he may have been a little loose lipped at times, but he did his job and he did what he could. Well, I mean, he I did can't. Make, when when people, he did say at one point. I think this is in one of the inquiries. He said, "I waited too long to go back in, and that's why he only found four people." Yeah. Um, 
he he regretted that. I think that. he was very very sad about yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. It haunted him. Yeah. But he did pull about four people out, um, which is better than I mean, yeah. most of the other lifeboats. Never went back. Right. None he, of them he, except his. Well, number four picked up, I think, a number of people, but that was when they were close into the ship. Well, and you know that people saw that lifeboat leaving and they jumped over trying to get picked up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think in Mama Axe's account on the 24th of April, uh, she talks about um, they picked people up out of the water. And that's one of the, the facts that doesn't match with her being in 13 and right. is more indicative of her being in 4. Right. Exactly, exactly. We have found zero evidence of her being in 13. I suspect someone at some point in time speculated she was there, and people have just kind of carried it across before. In my lifeboat research, I see that happen a lot. Yeah. Some place, somebody somewhere said the person was in this lifeboat, and other people are saying the same thing, yeah. but none of them have evidence. Right, exactly. Well... You know, then it it seems to work in some ways. Like for instance, Madeline Astor was for a time over on the starboard side near the gym. Right. Um, and you know, then it's known that she did interact with Madeline Astor. Of course, in my opinion, I think it was on the Carpathia. Yes, I. Th it would almost have to be on the Carpathia. Normally, yeah. a third class woman is not going to interact with a. Um, <laughs> the the richest yeah. woman on the ship. Yeah, yeah, that would have been more likely to have happened. Far more likely yeah. to have happened on the Carpathia. And this is this is stuff that you know I, in my family, this it was always talked about that she saw her on the deck, on the Titanic, and of course Madeline Astor. Then as I started researching, it was initially on the starboard side, and had she listened to her husband. And been willing to get into a lifeboat on the starboard side, he would have lived because men were being allowed into mm -hmm. lifeboats on the starboard side. Right, right. But she was too afraid to get into a lifeboat. And At that point in time. Yes, and that's really how her husband died. When they went over to the A deck starboard or port side, um, Astor was putting his wife into the lifeboat. And he said something along the lines of, can I enter too because my wife is in a delicate condition? Right. And Lightoller, who is pretty hardcore about this stuff, said yep. no. That's because he, in his mind, it was women and children uh, only, only. Right. not first. So Astor put his wife in the boat. Retreated. Um, and, and he backed off. <laughs> Astor is a person that I, I... I mean, the whole thing about Astor was like 41 or 42, um, marrying a 19-year-old girl. It's kind of right. like, oh, that dirty old man Daster. <laughs> old being the key word in my, my brain. And then when I turned 42, I went, oh, geez, I'm older than Aster. Yeah. But I also wasn't married to a 19-year-old. Right. Yeah. Well, and they both took a lot of heat for that and had to go immediately. That's why they went to Europe in the first place immediately. Because right. there was so much crap that they were getting because of that. So. Let's see. I think this needs to go here. And then this needs to go. Here. Yeah, that looks right. And then this. You know, one thing that's really interesting about Aster that I found out is that he's the one, he's thought to be the one who released the dogs from the dog kennel. True. And because uh, there wasn't, you know, a kennel for dogs on the Titanic. We're not and, sure where. Right, exactly. But And he had a dog on the Titanic named Kitty. Right. Yeah, so I always wanted a dog named Kitty. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> and... Uh, so, yeah, he, he's the one who let the dogs out of the kennel. And they were roaming it, all around the deck. Didn't they write a deck. song about that? What? Who, who let the dogs out? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh. I know, bad reference. Really bad oh. reference. Um, Bill. I don't even really? know. This. I, bear, I, I just remember when it became a big hit, it was kind of like, that's a hit? <laughs> I used to play this 
like the Mariners games. <sighs> well, that figures. <laughs> You know, um, actually, after Madeline asked her, after they decided not to get in on the starboard side, and she, they eventually got over to a deck um, on the port side. Um, you know, I think of my great grandmother because I think, whereas the account on the twenty fourth is considered well by you and George Behe and Don Lynch, and you know, to be the most accurate, she also kind of name drops. And, you know, I don't want to say that she was making stuff up, but, I mean, she talks about seeing Captain Smith getting in and out of lifeboats, you know, making that accusation, I guess, if you will, that he was, you know, contemplating saving himself, which I think is ludicrous. Um, and she said she saw the Strausses. And she pointed out, she said how wonderful that was that, she got out and, and, as she said, stuck by her husband's side. And I think, I don't know if she saw all this, if she did see the, um, I, I the Strausses. That's I more see, evidence I don't for the see how she side. could have seen the Strausses. Well, they were up by eight. Yeah, and eight was long gone by the time she got up on the deck. Well, they, they actually stayed on the deck for a while. And, oh, yeah. And, and they moved and, you know, sat down and were... Yeah. But, some, some people have said they went down to their cabin, which I totally disbelieve. Oh. Because Astor's, or no, Strauss's body was found. Right, but hers wasn't. His wasn't. Yeah. And, um, but I, she could have seen him sitting up on the deck toward the last, but she yeah. wouldn't have heard him saying, I'm not leaving you. She wouldn't have been on the ship. She wouldn't have been in the right place at the right time to hear that. I think she heard it on the Carpathia. I think where, I think she heard a lot of things on the Carpathia. Yep, that and she some then of it, became some of it became integrated into her own story. Absolutely, and I think that happened with a lot. I of agree, people. but I'm the first person to say it's important to understand the grieving and the trauma on the Carpathia, and how these stories were rampant for four days. And, and I don't blame these people. I really think they were so traumatized yeah. that, as you said, they adopted things that they heard and it became truth to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I and think it, my wife and I have different versions of same, the same things that happened to us. Right. I remember it one way. She remembers it yeah. another way. Yep. Uh, who's right? Well, I think I'm right and she thinks she's right. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is we, you know, we were both there at the same time and our memories yep. are different. Yeah. Um, I think she was so traumatized. She doesn't remember what she heard and discussed and what actually happened to her. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the truth is her story is so harrowing and crazy in itself. It would be pointless to actually add stuff or make stuff up. You don't really need to for it to be so outrageous. Mm-hmm. But I think I think some of it in that account was, I think it was stuff that were implanted memories that she incorporated into her story on the Carpathia, and I don't think it was intentional. Yeah, no, no, I don't think so either. Um, we, it, it's pretty well known among the historians that when you talk to somebody that gave an account fairly shortly after the Titanic sank. And the same person gives an account 50 years later. There's not, they're not quite the same thing. Lightoller said certain things in his book mm -hmm. that disagree with what he said at the inquiries in right. 1912. Yep. Um, but he was still a company man, and I think they all felt a great pressure to say things like the ship sank in one piece. Oh, yes. At the, in 1912, yes. And so they, I wrote an article years ago about what people say they saw. Right. And when I look at both the American and the British inquiry, mm -hmm. not looking at newspaper articles, but yep. just those things, the numbers are something like four people said it sank intact, two of them being officers. Officers. And there were 17 people that said it, it broke apart. Right. Just in that thing in there. You start looking at uh, newspaper articles, well, the number of people who say it broke apart goes way up. 
Mm -hmm. um, one of the appendixes in um, Honesty of Glass gets into that. Um, yeah, and then all this Jack Thayer's account where he actually drew it out, you know, and he drew how the ship broke apart in his... Well, he didn't really draw that. Oh, he didn't? No, no. He gave a description to um, Louis Skidmore, a uh, Carpathia passenger, oh. and Skidmore drew it. Okay. So when you look at the drawing, at one point you see the bow and the stern coming up right. like this, yeah. which nobody else really says. You know who Cameron describes it in the absolute opposite fashion? Like he he talks about it as if it were a banana, yeah, and it broke the banana theory. Yeah, broke up in the middle, which yeah. makes so much more sense. The bow was down, um, and yeah. Well, so. it, the whole the whole point that I'm getting to here is that the ship before it broke apart was like this. Yep. Here's the bow. Here's the stern. Right. And when it broke, it and I'm not getting into the. <clears throat> Top side down or whatever, but when it broke, it's very unlikely the bow, which was full of water, right, is going to do this. It did not do that. Now there was, there is evidence that when it broke apart, this stern part, even the bridge area came up out of the water a little bit. Sure. And then it went almost immediately started back down again. Right. Um, a number of uh, uh, survivors mentioned that. It was going down and then it came back up a little bit. Uh -huh. um, uh, but it was so chaotic in those last minutes. Yeah. I wonder sometimes, I think, did Mama Ax see the ship break up or did she just look away? I mean, I think a lot of people said they couldn't they couldn't yeah, look at it. But didn't didn't Mama Ax I, I I know we you and I have read a number of her accounts. Mm -hmm. Didn't one of her accounts say she kind of went unconscious? In yeah, the life she world? said she was close to a dead faint. <clears throat> so but she I, may not have been conscious to see the uh, life. I think the she ship was break apart. I, I don't know. I think you know it was the language of the time. I think they were very cold. Mm -hmm. I think they were huddled. I don't think she was unconscious. I think they were. Um, just really suffering terribly from mm -hmm. the cold. And depending on where you are in the lifeboat, you may not be facing the ship at all. Right. And, and, and if I, you've pulled a ways away, and it, it's dark, it was and there's lot. no lights on. Right. And you could see, it, the cool thing is people talking about how you could see this, this ship in an outline with no stars. Because yeah. all you see in oh, the background is the stars. There but, were a lot of stars. And this, the ship was black, you know, without the stars. Mm -hmm. So you could see the outline of the ship because it was the absence of stars. When um, back last year, which would be 2021, uh, last April, um, we, Kent Layton, Ted Fitch and I, Tom Linsky, along with a number of other uh, people, we came out with two videos of the sinking. Mm-hmm. One of them is called Honesty of Glass Live. They're both on YouTube. Honesty of Glass Live, and the other one is called Sinking of the Titanic Historian Edition. Is, is that something I can put a link to the uh, yeah. in the description? Yeah, they're both in YouTube. On, in YouTube, one of them uh, you have uh, we, we act, real time sinking of the ship. Right, I've seen that one. And you've got. Tad and Kent and I talking over it about what you're seeing. Right. Uh, the the other one, there's no talking. There's captions. Mm -hmm. um, so you saying what you're seeing, and um, we're trying to get as close as possible to what we really think happened. Okay. Um, uh, In terms of the mechanics of the breakup, or uh, the mechanics of the breakup. Okay. It uh, doesn't get so much into the people. I mean, there's one scene in the early part where you see the iceberg hit the Titanic and you see it coming down the starboard side from the viewpoint of Quartermaster Rowe out on the stern docking bridge. And right. you can see Rowe standing there mm -hmm. as the life as the iceberg goes by. Right. Um, there's another scene late in the sinking sequence where you can see two people jumping off the port bridge into the water. And those are Smith and Anders. Right. Because that's what we believe happened. Mm -hmm. um, Why do you think they never found their bodies? Most bodies were not found. Right. There were there were three over three hundred found though. 
337 if I remember my article that I wrote. Right, but, yeah, um, read it. And, and some of the bodies, one of the bodies I think was found in like June. Right, yeah. Um, so if they're, uh, the numbers are in my article and I'm not remembering them off the top of my head. It's been a long time since I read it. But um, I think it's like 23% of the people that were on the ship, their bodies were found. Which means most of the bodies, they sank to the bottom. They, yeah, it's interesting. They got yeah. washed. They they. The currents took the them. currents took them away, and they got scattered, and they were just never seen. Yeah. Um, Do you know if uh, Captain Smith had a life jacket on? I think he must have, and I'll tell you why. It's like Andrews. I know he is is he said put your life jacket on, the passengers need to see you wearing right. it. Right, he was telling one of the stewardesses that. And I, I think that, based on that, I think he probably did have a life jacket on. No, he knew he wasn't going to survive it, but he wanted to be a good example to people. And I think for that reason, Smith probably did too. Not something I particularly have looked at before, but yeah, he... I've never thought yeah. about that before, but I, I would like to... I remember light taller had a life jacket but at a certain point he took it off but maybe i'm remembering well he, wrong. i remember him talking about he had on his white seaman's wool sweater mm -hmm. and that he was covered in sweat because he was working yes. so hard and you know, these men were just doing everything they could as fast as they could mm -hmm. to get these these boats launched and you know to think it, he was out there and it was 27 degrees and he said he was just covered in sweat mm -hmm. he was just exhausted yes. Yeah, um, would have been a horrible night. <laughs> Make sure you get a look at the props. Yes, the center prop has three blades, as it should be. Yep, as has been proven. <laughs> and who proved it? Mark Turnside. Yes, and what should I reference in the description for them to go and do the research? Um, from Har the, he, f he found documentation from Harlan and Wolf that said it had a three-bladed propeller. Now, let's see. You know, one thing recently, talking, you know, somebody tried to engage me in some nonsense about the bunker fire. And I, I, took, I alarmed them, or I disarmed them by saying, actually, I think that bunker fire saved my life. <laughs> and that was because if... They, it didn't exist, uh, they wouldn't have had to, to shift all that coal, tons and tons and tons of coal from the starboard side to the port side, causing an artificial listing of the ship, which was actually not noticed by people that the ship was slightly listing uh, to the port. And that was because they had shifted all that coal. And the fact that the ship was listing, look at that, uh, meant that when all the water rushed in on the starboard side, it, it didn't capsize mm -hmm. because it was counterbalanced by all the coal on the other side. Look at I'm my little on. Easter egg. <laughs> <laughs> I've almost. Let's see. Got a good idea of how it's fitting here. Um, I've read some on it. Uh, that may have something to do with it. I'm that, why the ship didn't capsize when the all the water rushed into the starboard side. It was that that could be a piece of the puzzle. Um, so. I'm not. A, I've I've read it. I I don't really. Um, I really can't say too much one way or the other as to what it actually did. But I don't think it had anything to do with the accident or, or um, impacting the steel or anything. I don't believe that. I've got this close to where it belongs, but... Oh, oh. Where do I? I love that popping sound. That's very satisfying. Oh, 
Oop, that was not good. Pop the piece out. So what you've got here is you've got part of the port, the pork hull plating around the propellers. Here's the anti-fouling paint. Here's the um, side of the ship. Here's the beginning of the poop deck. Fabulous. And this picture agrees with your, as I proceed to break things, Your picture agrees with um, the manual once I fix this part that I just broke. You gotta be careful because sometimes if you push something a little too hard, it breaks. Yes, that's what happened when I was building the rudder. Did you find out what was rattling? No, oh, but I do see where I'm. Do I need to get back on the floor and find a piece? Well, let me stare at this. Let me go down. I'll go down there and take a look. Got it. Did you find it? Yep. Yep. Okay, so this goes here. Right? And this goes here. Ta da! All fixed. Yay! So, yeah. Show your work. <laughs> Show my work. Hull plating. With, with Legos to this level, you've got always got to go back and double check to make sure everything works the way it's supposed to. And as we just found out, I have to be careful where I place my hands because if I put too much pressure on one space, it's, something breaks. Right. And that's not what we want. No. So this is where I was. Certainly not at midnight. Is it midnight? Yes. It's five after midnight. Okay, so, yeah, Look at that. The, 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 the book agrees with what's there. Awesome. Well, Bill, I can't thank you enough for doing this. This has been an absolute wonderful evening, and I've enjoyed all of our discussions and tangents. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay and honestly i would like nothing better than for you to for us to sit here and do the rest of this ship <laughs> and geek out and talk about it um i don't think your wife would appreciate that <laughs> too much but i appreciate you guys coming up from south carolina and by way of visit. michigan yep by way of michigan okay the next piece or a large section is the hull plating on the other side yes so that yeah i just finished 38 right here it says now you're going to work on 39 which is kind of the reversal of what i just did so i get to experience exactly what you did yeah <laughs> yeah and I'm, I'm glancing at the the pieces and i'm going yeah this is pretty much the same thing So now that you've had a chance to see the project close up, I mean, you've talked, we've talked, and you've said that you think you might actually buy it and do it. What's your thinking about? <laughs> uh, I've got to find, the, the, th the whole issue is finding the time. I mean, it's cool. I really like it. Um, the, the whole flaw to something like this is you spend, a, you spend a lot of time building it and having fun building it, and you get it done, and then you sit it on the shelf. 
<laughs> Sorry, you do what? And then after that, you have to dust it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it, it, it's good. Well, like, I've got that, that last Lego Titanic. Or it's not like Lego. It's Kobe, I think it is. I built it. It's cool. It's not as accurate as this one is. Um, but it's kind of like, okay, now it's sitting on the shelf collecting dust. I can't put it in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a cool thing to have, but the the fun part to me is building them. Oh, absolutely, I agree. I mean, even the the few places where I made a mistake and I had to go back and fix it, uh -huh. that's cool. That's cool. I don't mind that. Um. Yeah, I felt the same way. I mean, after my husband initially helped me, um, I've enjoyed every moment of it. I really haven't. Uh, I, f I find the directions in terms of the pictograms being easy to yeah. follow for the most yeah. part. I the, the, the trick, and I say this from having worked on a number of Legos models, is, ident is differentiating certain pieces. Like, here's an example. If I'm working left to right, oh, here's a yellow piece. No, wait, that's yellow. Yeah, you know, you, you you sometimes the colors just a little bit different. You right there's exactly. certain cases of where you you've got a an angled or a sloping piece. Right, sloping this versus sloping this. You've got to pick that up. Right, and sometimes you can't. There's a couple of times where there's the red anti fouling paint, but then there's a piece that's brown. They're very close. The colors are not that yeah. distinct. Well, I mean, I, 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 I picked like out old. this. This is this is an old, you know, this is a 50-year-old Lego piece, right? Here. Right, exactly. Um, this here is a different color. Yes. Um, and I can pick that up with too much, without too much trouble. And then, but the, like you were saying, the there's two kinds of yellow, too. Uh, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's this kind of a tannish color. Yeah. Yeah, that's a little, even in the video, you can see that. The first two are yellow, and then the one on the top is, what would you call that, buff, tan? I'd call it tan. Yeah. So it's... This is buff. Yes. And this is eventually going to line up like this. Yay! Look at that. Look at that. So... And the boilers, or the, the engines are going to end up in the front end here. Yep. You've got space for them, but they're not there yet. Yeah. All right. So thank you <laughs> so much for doing this. It was an absolute was joy. It was fun. Yeah. When are you going to come back? <clears throat> make some more videos. <laughs> what I really like is for people, <clears throat> if you have any questions, you should ask them. Put them in the comments for Bill. Or, <laughs> yeah. Questions or comments? Yeah. yeah. If I'm home, I have research material. I can look things up. Amazing. I can ask you something, and you have libraries full of documentation in your computer, and you can put your hands on things faster than anybody I, I know. <laughs> That's because a long time ago, I started keeping track of things. I love yeah. spreadsheets. Oh, that's I creepy. put a lot of things in spreadsheets, yeah. and it makes it a lot easier to find things. And spreadsheets are good because also because you could easily find, you can filter things, you can sort things, yeah. um, and then put it back the way it was, the order it was. Right. And um, it's just easy to keep track of things. Most of the, most of the main Titanic books I have on an electronic format. So I can just bring it up and search it. Right. Um, I've got my own books in electronic format. Some of that, I remember enough about it to know where things are. Right. Um, but, and I have a whole bookcase full of Titanic stuff, which you'll see when you come up to my house one of these yes, days. Yes, which I will. I'll help you build, you know, a couple bags of your Lego Titanic. <laughs> yes. In Can the I bathtub. Can I put it on the coffee table? No. In the bathtub. <laughs> well, actually, would it fit in the bath? Isn't it like over four feet eventually? 
It's well, 53 it'll fit, inches. It'll fit in the bathtub. Yeah. As long as nobody is in with it. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, you put the turn on the water and let it fill up, and this Titanic's going to sink again. Yeah, I, I'd like to put it in my pond out back, but that won't go too well. The, the only way that would work is if you bought a, a under the water stand to set it on. Yeah, that would be very cool. There yeah. I, Yes. I had uh, a couple years ago. But then your koi babies would end up inside the Titanic. Yeah, that would be problematic. A couple years ago, I got a plastic floaty of the Titanic, and it was just floating around for weeks. And I went out there one time, and there were two frogs mating, sitting on the Titanic. <laughs> and I sent them, I pushed it, and sent them across the pond. And with the caption, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Frog take a honeymoon cruise across the pond. <laughs> Which is kind of dark humor, I suppose. Yeah, slightly, slightly. Yeah. So, do you have anything, any final words? Well, this was fun. Um, now I just have to figure out I'm going to buy this myself. But then, you, like you said, the Lego people have run out. That's true. You can buy one on eBay for like... Two and a half times the original offering price. <laughs> uh, I'll go back and buy books. <laughs> and I don't even buy a lot of those anymore. I'm yeah. doing a lot of rereading the last few years. Yes. That's the nice thing about having your own library. You can just go and pull an old book out and go, Oh, I remember liking this one. I'll read this now. Yep. And right now I'm reading the same book you are. <laughs>